Welcome to Not Your Ordinary Parts, a podcast where we talk about hard things associated with the human experience with the goal of increasing awareness, growth, and healing. You may hear information from professionally licensed therapists, life coaches, healers, doctors, etc. This information is not medical advice or therapy and is not meant to replace actual therapy or instructions given by a doctor or personal therapist. I'm your host, Jalon Johnson. My guest today is Dr. Amy Apigian. Dr. Amy is the leading medical expert on how life experiences get stored in the body and restoring the body to its best state of health through her signature model and methodology, the biology of trauma. She is a double board certified medical physician in preventative medicine and addiction medicine, has a master's in biochemistry and a master's in public health. In addition to her medical training, she is also a certified functional medicine physician and has training and certifications specifically in neuroautoimmunity, nutrition, genetics for addictions, mental health, and mood and behavioral disorders. Dr. Amy has several certifications in various trauma therapies, including the Instinctual Trauma Response Model, Somatic Experiencing, the Neuroaffective Touch, and Neuroaffective Touch. Dr. Amy's approach and methodology both adds to and bridges trauma work and medicine by reverse engineering the chronic effects of trauma on the nervous system and body on a cellular level. I got through that. <laughs> Thank you so much for being my guest, Dr. Amy, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Jalon. It's it's really nice to be here. I'm really looking forward to this, and I just love what you are doing. I appreciate that. I tried my best to give a brief description of what you do. I don't think that's really possible because you're so so well versed in so many things, but just so that the audience can get to know you a little bit better, would you mind giving us a bit of background about yourself and who you are? Yeah, so I am a medical physician and never saw myself going into trauma. And I was actually very traditionally trained medical school and was headed into what I did was three and a half years of general surgery residency. So about as traditional medicine as you can get. And very much was a person who didn't like to be bothered by feelings, would really have preferred not to have any feelings at all, and was just used to being able to uh, kind of push my body and wanted my body to always uh, be able to do more for me. And whether that was physically, and I was very active, uh, riding my bike, running, or uh, hiking, or being able to perform well academically, or certainly certainly in residency, that was a big deal to get through those long hours, those long surgeries, and be able to still do well and feel well. And so I always I always saw kind of like the emotions and feelings as hindrances, as things that that I ah like I just wish were not necessarily part because I didn't know what to do with them. But what changed my life was while I was in medical school, I became a foster parent and then adopted Miguel. So he was the first foster child that they placed with me. And it was, I decided to become a foster parent just after I had finished my master's in biochemistry, had a few months of free space before I jumped back into the clinical rotations of third year medical school. And I felt like I had always been uh, interested in children who had rough experiences. I had already participated in the Big Brother, Big Sister program as a teenager. And so it was just one of those things where it's just like, I think this is the the best thing to use my time for right now when I have free space. But it wasn't until I had actually started my uh, medical school rotations and was in the, the hospital rotations that they called me. And they told me about Miguel. He was four years old at the time. They told me about his history. They told me why he had already not done well in all of the homes that they had placed him in and why they thought that placing him with me was somewhere where he would be successful. And at the time, oh my goodness, Jalone, like at the time I just knew that what he needed was love. And my goodness, like I had that. I had I had so much love for him already. And knowing that that's what he needed i was i was just sure that with time and with love and with the 
uh, I would say just kind of like the, the support and the stability, stability that he would do really well. And that's certainly what the social worker told me as well. And when I brought him in and realized that as the months continued, that time was not actually healing him and my love was actually not healing him. In fact, what I was watching was him reacting to my love. And the more times that we would have these moments of true connection and our eyes would meet and and you'd have that mutual shared joy and excitement over something that you had just seen. And it was after those moments that he would lash out and become even more aggressive and hurting me physically. And taking him to the therapies was not helping. In fact, I would take him to the therapies or sometimes I would have the the play therapist come into my home and he would be worse afterwards. Like it would just be like they were stirring things up without actually releasing anything or resolving anything. And having to deal with this in the home, of course, was extremely challenging because now he's five, he's going on six, he's growing and he's not able to manage his own reactions. And his reactions were were quite um, extreme, I would say, that though I know that many other adopted children or foster children, sometimes even biological children, um, have these kinds of reactions as well. But he would go into rages and he would throw things, destroy things. He would hit me, punch me, kick me, bite me. And even it got to the point where a few times he expressed and did try to kill me. And realizing that like this, this is not going the way I thought it would go, right? Like this is not what I had in mind for his healing, his healing. Like I I just so much wanted him to be able to rise above his childhood and feel the love that I had for him. And I realized that he couldn't even feel it. And when he did feel a glimpse of that, that's what would trigger him and would scare him because love was scary for him. And I, I want to say, thankfully, Jalone, right? Like, thankfully, this was big enough that I I had to do something. It wasn't something that I could just be like, oh, well, you know, we're getting by, and so we'll make the the best of it. Like, th- this was not getting by. This this was becoming dangerous. This was becoming serious, and so I was. I was brought down to my lowest point with him and realizing I've got to change everything that I'm doing with him. And I realized that everything that I knew that I thought I knew about trauma was completely wrong. And I had to just go in and be willing to learn, learn, and just become a student of him, his body, his reactions, my body, how I can change this dynamic what does he need? If, if this is not what he needs, what does he need? And it, it brought me into this space of trauma that of course now, right? Like has become my career, but that's, that's how I got into trauma. And then as I watched my own self, I realized I started to see like, wait a second. Like, I think some of his reactions and triggers are ones that are way more extreme than what I have had. But yet I see, I think I have some of these same fears that he does of loving and opening myself up to love and belonging. And so I started to see that, ah, like, I don't think that this is just these kinds of kids. Like, I think this is a lot of people. And the more that I got into my medical career, I saw it in all of my patients to the point where for some patients, they were coming in with health issues and symptoms that really had no medical explanation. And I was seeing that, wait a second, like there's so much of this. I didn't even have the words back then, right? Like this emotional component. So that's when I started studying like psychosomatic syndromes, because I realized that no, like there's something, there's something here, but it's been piecing it together over the years to actually even have language to express it, to communicate it, and then to be able to teach it now. And so as I was actually coming out of my own health, chronic health conditions that I got to personally experience, 
I, that was when I decided that this type of work was the most meaningful to me. And I wanted to find a way to make trauma actually become a field of medicine and learn how to integrate it with the other treatments and approaches and even lifestyle and diets, because I saw that it, it it's all connected because we're, we're all just talking about the body. And now that I saw just how much trauma gets stored in the body, I realized that I would never be able to, and someone else would never be able to just go to therapy and talk about something without also addressing the body aspects of how trauma has affected our biology. And now our body is sick enough that it gets stuck in those trauma responses without the tools to address the body and the biology piece. Wow. Um, that was uh, such an incredible story. And, and it, it seems like your adopted son, Miguel, is the reason why you were able to go into this field because you had to dig deeper to learn to understand what it was that was missing in your connection with him. And that, I guess it's safe to say, led you into the work that you're doing now. Absolutely. If it hadn't have been for Miguel, like I wouldn't be here today. I would, I would probably still be in some uh, hospital or clinic and working as a traditional medical physician, not ever, not, not, not even having my eyes opened to what's underneath the surface. And that was one of the biggest gifts that Miguel gave me. He gave me many, he gave me many, but that was definitely one of the biggest gifts. I was going to say, I mean, my eyes. It, it took a lot of work to, to get to it because of what you described, it seemed like it was a, a pretty painful year or, or a couple of years, but he allowed you six years, six years. <laughs> It, so it was six years that you it took in order for you to get to a, a a place of understanding with Miguel. Yes. Oh wow. Okay. Yes, and to figure out the pieces that he needed. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So that, it seems like it was a, a pretty painful. Yeah. This picture. didn't come at a this this didn't come at a cheap cost. <laughs> this this was this was yeah. You are right. This this came at a very a very hard hard road. Mm. Mm-hmm. What were some of the um, experiences, I guess, that you discovered from working with Miguel and trying to, to, you know, uncover what it was that was preventing him from being able to feel that you saw in yourself? Mm. Once I realized that we weren't making the progress that I had wanted to, that I had assumed we would, I started studying attachment. And as I studied attachment, I started to recognize myself and some of what I was learning. And then when I would, you know, because for me, it's, it wasn't just learning, right? Like I've got to, I've got to learn what I need to apply. Hmm. I, I love those people who get to learn just because it's maybe what they're studying. But for me, like this, this was my life. This was my home. And this was my son. So it was, I need to learn what I can actually apply. And there was a lot that I learned that I was like, okay, that's great information, but I have no idea how to actually apply that in real life in a way that will make a meaningful difference for Miguel. But one of the things that I really saw through that were these reactions that he was having because of his attachment to what I call now attachment pains. And there are six and really seven uh, different attachment pains. And the more attachment pain that a person has, the more they react to what they perceive as vulnerability in relationships. And it's a very difficult very difficult balance to walk because you're trying, you're having to balance the need for connection and yet keeping people far enough away that your heart still feels safe. And because that's never really possible to have connection 
and keep people away, <laughs> then there's always this tug and pull and these reactions where in this moment, I am going to connect with you, but in the next moment, I'm going to need to push you away. But then later on, I'm going to want to reconnect with you. And now I'm going to push you away again. And I started to see some of those fears that I had of the ways in which I have kept people at arm's length and the ways in which I have been, uh, I have had parts of me that have these core beliefs that I am unlovable. And if I'm unlovable, then of course I'm going to keep you at arm's length because I don't, I don't want you to see all of me because if you saw all of me, you would leave. And so I started just to see through his behaviors an explanation for why he would react in those ways. And that's really what started to click for me because that's when I started to realize that there was a pattern and it was a very predictable pattern. It, it wasn't the chaotic, uh, chaotic, unpredictable reactions that I had thought they were where I never knew when he was going to react. As I started to really dive deep into the attachment and realized and understood what were the triggers for people with attachment insecurities or attachment pains or attachment trauma, what, what were their triggers, then I could see, oh, yes, this is when that would have triggered him. And then here's the behavior popping up. But it allowed me to see one step prior to the behavior. Now, of course, for Miguel at that time, the behaviors were so big, right? It wasn't just a, a minor reaction. It was a, I'm going to throw the whole bookcase down on the floor and, you know, run around. And so it was, once that happened, I realized it's too late for me to try to repair in that moment. I've got to learn how to, how to understand so well what the triggers are for attachment pains that I can buffer that so that the reactions either don't come or are less. And it was fascinating for me to then see on a lesser extreme level how so much of my own actions and behaviors over the years had been for the same reasons of not feeling safe to be seen, not feeling safe to open my heart. Wow. Thank you for sharing that and for for being willing to to be vulnerable enough to share your own experiences and uh, your own feelings and insecurities. Um, I was just thinking while you were talking, I was like, man, she's a doctor. I couldn't imagine going into a doctor's office <laughs> and having my doctor share the things that you just shared because it's just not a thing. Um, but, and I, I was also thinking how it must feel now for you to have triumphed over what you were experiencing compared to maybe one of the lowest moments, like you mentioned when, like you said, maybe Miguel threw the bookcase over and you just were feeling like, you know, what did I get myself into? Um, so I'm I'm super proud of you for doing the work to figure it out. And it must be so rewarding now. And I'm sure that your bond and your relationship with Miguel is just priceless at this point. Yeah. So part of our journey in Jalone is that he is no longer with me. Okay. So that is kind of like the, the next piece and layer to to our story. Um, which speaking of parts, my goodness, like that, that was that was the most difficult thing that I've been through and, um, and the parts that I got to discover and, and work with at that point. Um, but I don't know, like, you know, you, you talk, you're, you're, you're talking about like feeling triumphant and no, like I, I, I personally have never, <laughs> have never felt that way, Jalone. And I think that it's because there's layers, right? And as I, as I heal one layer the next layer has the space to surface now. And then as I work with that layer and process that and heal that and learn how to work with that part, 
then there's space for the next layer to surface. And so I have never gotten to the place where I have felt, oof, my work is done, right? Thank goodness that I went through that. Glad it's over. It's, it's never, it's never been over. And I think that a lot of people maybe have that perception around the healing process is, oh, I just need to go and I need to heal this one story or heal this one thing, not realizing that, no, that one thing is connected to everything else. And there's layers to that connection, layers that you're not even aware of at this time, which is a good thing, right? Like if we were actually aware of all of the layers <laughs> that we needed to heal, all of the, I want to say the layers of the beliefs that our parts have. And we can w discover and work with one layer as it, as it surfaces in that and that specific scenario as it's coming up in our life, not realizing then that that same part has a deeper layer and it's going to be connected to this other thing in our life that, that we don't know about yet. And we don't need to know about that yet, right? Like we don't need to control that process, but we never, we never stop. We never stop. We never stop healing. At least I've never stopped healing. Now that once I got on my own healing journey, it's been it's been layers, but I will say that looking back to where I was, the difference is night and day. Mm -hmm. And even people who watch my old YouTube videos, they will comment on that. They comment on how different I look. They can see how back then I was still in this trauma, trauma state, you know, the, the chronic functional freeze. And they've seen that as a result of me continuing to do work and to just do the next layer as it surfaces and as it's ready to be healed, then it allows so much more expansion and authenticity and expression in my life. But there's never been for me like this moment of triumph and, and sense of completion. I, I don't know if that makes sense. No, of course it does. And and you're you're giving the the onion analogy of healing, which the the layers you got to peel back one layer to get to the other one. And I've heard that one so often, so I understand what you mean for sure. Yeah, I think that the trauma work is very much an onion layer. And given my background as a physician, I think especially. I wanted to know how deep was the onion. I wanted to be able to control that process. Mm. I wanted to go into it, you know, as I did into anatomy and physiology and knowing exactly what was ahead of me. And, and that's, that's been a growth for me as well is learning that I, I don't need to control the healing process. I don't need to invite things that need to be healed. I can just allow as I live my life. That's pretty powerful because I think a lot of people, uh, including myself, who have had some trauma in their background, control equals safety. Control equals safety. Mm -hmm. And without feeling safe. Yeah. So that's, that's, yeah, there's, there's <laughs> nowhere to go or nowhere to be. So I think control is a big thing. So for you to be able to, to understand that and, and acquiesce to it, that's pretty huge. It's been a huge change and it didn't come easy. That was one of the layers that I got to work with. And it wasn't the first layer, Jelona. Mm. And I think that that's, there's a reason why that's not the first layer, because even as I walk people through my courses and we're starting the trauma work, I'm doing it in such a way I'm starting them with teaching them how to be better in control be better in control of their, of their emotional states, be better in control of their body so that I'm actually giving them control first because that safety is where we have to start. We can't heal if we don't feel safe. And so trying to tell someone that, oh, you just need to let go of the control is not the first place to start with trauma work. I need to teach them how to understand 
their body, how to understand when they are in a stress response versus when their body is in a trauma response and what to do because they're very different. The body needs something very different when it's in the trauma place than when it's in the stress place. And without that understanding, you always feel out of control. You don't understand your body's reactions. You don't understand what to do. And so you're always feeling like you're one step behind and just kind of chasing chasing your reactions. And so the first step, which, which maybe seem weird to some people, but the first step is actually establishing some sense of control. Now, the word that I use in my courses is manageable. I don't use the word control, but my, what I do is in the first 21 days, in the first 21 days is I teach people how to make what has been unmanageable, what has felt unmanageable and out of control, make it manageable. I'm not promising to make it comfortable, Jalone. I'm promising that what I teach them will help them make it feel manageable, which manageable, right, is another word for control. I have some sense of control over my reactions, over my body, my body's responses. And that is huge because without that sense of I can keep things manageable, I can do that for myself we still are in that state of, I don't feel safe. And so that's how I bring safety in from the very beginning with trauma work is helping a person learn how to keep things manageable. Gotcha. That sounds incredible. Um, And we'll get into that a little bit later, but uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about your, um, you're the founder and the CEO of Trauma Healing Accelerated. And you offer the 21 day course that you were speaking about, which is called the 21 day journey to calm aliveness. Um, so if you could, if someone wanted to know how the course works and what's it about, could you go a little bit into detail about that? Yes. So in the body, we have three different operating systems and those three operating systems. One is what I call calm aliveness, where we are calm and yet not calm and tired, not calm and exhausted, right? But we're actually calm and very alive, very alive. And then another operating system that our body has is the stress response. And it's a completely different physiology so that it's it's telling our body to live differently than when we feel safe and connected and grounded in that calm, alive state. But then we have this third operating system of our body, and that is the trauma response. And people have not known what it feels like to be in these different states. They just kind of feel things, right? And that was part of why I did not like to feel things was because it felt confusing to me. I didn't know what I felt. And if I don't know what I really feel like, how am I supposed to do anything about it? And So understanding this is what it feels like to be in the stress response. And this is what it feels like to be in the trauma response. So that at any given moment, a person can know this is where my body is right now, which means that I also have the tools. And that's what I teach in the 21 day journey, the tools to know what to do for this moment right now. So in, when we are working with stored trauma in the body, As I was just referring to, we have to start with a felt sense of safety. Have to. And you can look at all the other trauma experts, Bessel van der Kolk, Stephen Porges, Gabor Mate, Peter Levine, like all of them talk about the need for safety when we're dealing with trauma. It is where we have to start. But how do we actually achieve that, right? Like we talk about it, but until we can actually make it tangible, It just stays as a theory, as an idea without us actually knowing, okay, this is how I bring in safety. So that's the whole first week of my 21 day journey. I'm teaching basic somatic exercises. Somatic meaning we're just working with your body rather than talking about things where we're putting your mind's attention on different aspects of your body. And I'm teaching them how to know what it feels like 
for their body to actually feel safe. Most of the people going through my 21 day journey realize that they've never actually felt safe in their body, but they don't know that until they feel it. And until they feel it, that's when they're like, oh, if this is what safe in my body feels like, yeah, no, I've never felt this. But until you feel that, you don't even know that you don't feel that. And that's the whole first week of the 21 day journey. Now, these exercises are very short exercises and they include different things like movement of certain muscle groups in a certain way, contact with our body, perhaps in a certain way, engaging our senses in a very specific way. And these are all guided and they are about 10 minutes every day of a guided somatic exercise. But once you learn the exercise, you can do it within two minutes. It's just as I'm teaching it, because I'm teaching the science behind it, I'm teaching what this is doing and how to do it so that it takes longer. So when a person is actually going through the 21 day journey, there, they are 10 minute exercises every day that they'll be watching in a pre-recorded video that I send out every day. The whole second week of the 21 day journey. Now, as the body has a felt sense of safety, the next thing that it needs is a felt sense of support. The trauma response has to have safety. We can't do anything without that safety. It will stay in the trauma response. But as the body starts to come out of that trauma response, because it feels safe now, it will actually go into the stress response. And so as people are doing trauma work the right way, if they're doing it the right way, they will actually start to experience a little more energy, which means a little more anxiety, a little more anger, like their body, their emotions will start to come alive. We talk about, you know, these places have have been frozen and and it's like they start to thaw out and they start to feel things that have been numb before. And as the body starts to feel things, what we actually need at that moment is not safety anymore. We actually need a felt sense of support. And so that's the whole second week of the 21 day journey. Our basic 10 minute somatic exercises, teaching a person how to create a felt sense of support for themselves for their body. This is very different than saying mantras and saying affirmations, than talking about it and telling yourself that you feel safe and supported. This is actually learning how to create that felt sensation for our body in this present moment. And it's very powerful shift alone because so many people have been in therapy for years and they're relying on someone else to kind of create these felt sensations for them of safety and of support. But to be able to learn that I can do this for myself and here's exactly what I do. And it actually only takes two minutes of my time so that when they start to get triggered, when they start to have a reaction, they don't need to wait until their next therapist appointment. They can make it manageable in that moment and thus be able to maintain a sense of safety, control, and support now is what we're going to add on. And as the body has a felt sense of support, now it's going to be able to start dropping into that uh, calm alive state, which is where we feel grounded, centered. We're in the flow. We're present. These are all aspects of being in that calm alive state. And that's when we get to learn how to build our window of tolerance for what we find manageable. Because for so many people, they experience so many triggers that it's always making things feel unmanageable. And we've got to actually build our window of tolerance so that we can handle triggers that don't break us out of that window of what we can feel is manageable. And this is very powerful because this holds the secret for people to be able to do other therapies, to be able to do aspects, maybe modalities that help them process different events in their life or process a different time in their life. You can't successfully process any trauma without these three pieces in place, safety and then support and then knowing how to do that expansion and manageability safely. 
And so many people try to just jump into therapy without knowing how to do it safely. And they have major setbacks. And what I was experiencing was I would be experiencing setbacks in my physical health. And I would, for example, experience severe fatigue after a therapy session. And I thought that that was normal because that's what happened every single time I'd go in and I have this amazing therapy session. And I felt like, oh, like we, we went deep into that one. Right. And then I'd be wiped out and I would just be tired. I'd have brain fog. It'd be hard to concentrate and focus. And I, that was the reaction that I was having. And I see that so many other people have similar things happening with their physical health. Their physical health is telling them that this is actually not helpful. It's stirring things up. And that's how the body expresses it is in symptoms, conditions, and, and diagnoses. And so to be able to now have the tools where you know how to, you know how to do those therapies in a safe way changes everything because it puts you back in the driver's seat for your body rather than expecting someone else to know what's best for you. And again, going back to this idea of just, I, I need a sense of control over my life. This is how we get that. We get that by learning these exercises, going through this process, like the 21 day journey that I offer, where you're laying the foundation for what you need to understand your body and these different states, operating systems of your own body and what each state needs at any given moment. And it, and it allows so much more freedom as you navigate life because you, you understand your body and you know what it needs. So that's what the 21 day journey is, is it's a starting place for becoming the expert in your own body, knowing seven different exercises for creating a felt sense of safety, and then seven different exercises for creating a felt sense of support, and then seven different exercises for learning how to keep things manageable, how to safely process and expand things all the while keeping it manageable so that you are learning how to pace your healing process and not just be at the mercy of what happens to you and, and trying to hold on for dear life. Wow. That, that sounds life-changing. I mean, it, it, it really does to me because even someone starting therapy who may be relying on their therapist to manage their mood or their emotions, they're still dependent on someone else. Even though they may be doing healing work, they're still reliant on another person to manage their emotional state. So this sounds like it's the key to self-reliance, which then would allow you to dive deeper into so many other modalities and somatic healing techniques. Yes. And as you say that, like I, I'm reminded of the need to, as an adult, right? It's different when I'm working with kids. But once we reach adulthood, we have to get to that place where I can manage myself to even feel safe to engage authentically in a relationship with someone else. Mm. And I think that people still have that backwards sometimes where they think, oh, but don't I need to connect with someone else in order to be able to connect with myself? And, and no, like actually once we become adults, we actually have to learn how to create safety for ourselves first. And then we can extend that and maintain a sense of safety for myself while in connection and relationship with someone else. But if I've only ever tried to use someone else to feel safe, I'm never going to truly feel safe, Jalone. Because the one person that I'm always with is myself. Wherever I go, there I am. <laughs> and so I've got to learn got to learn how to, how to understand Amy. I've got to learn how, how she reacts and the different parts of her and what she needs at any given moment so that I can truly feel safe no matter where I am in the world, because I am always home. I always have my biggest resource with myself, which is myself. Mm. It's not another person. And that's what allows me to then stand on my own two feet, feeling confident, feeling safe, feeling safe and safe enough that I can 
open up to other people because I know that I can keep things manageable. I know that I have those tools that I'm not just hoping that this person won't hurt me like other people have. It's like, well, but I've got tools now. Like I can navigate relationships, navigate life, navigate my career, navigate stress, navigate everything very differently because I have the sense. I know that I can keep things manageable for myself. I have those tools and I have the understanding to know exactly what's happening in my body at any given moment and be able to give it what it needs. Wow. That is, I mean, just thinking about that, that, that changes almost everything for, for so many people. Yeah. Because I mean, we may be at work or we may be with our partner or in traffic and we, we get, um, activated by something someone else does or we get into it, go into a stress response and then we react we react. So now having the tools to know, to say, okay, this is what's happening. I know how to change this. I know how to manage it. And then you bring yourself out of activation. That's a game changer. Without having to rely on mindset and motivation to bring you out of activation, because I'm assuming that most people listening to your podcast by now know that that doesn't work, Mm -hmm. right? Like we can't actually only use our brain to convince our body to not react. Our body reacts because that's what it does. And so knowing the body piece changes everything. Wow. So I wanted to ask another question. And I think this is um, what you're most known for is your, your signature model. And that is the biology of trauma. So can you explain what the biology of trauma is and how life experiences can get stored in the body? The biology of trauma is the understanding that life experiences do not just affect us emotionally or psychologically, but they actually create lasting changes in our biology as our body adapts to our life experiences. And we start adapting to our life experiences as early as in utero, Jalone. We are already adapting to what environment am I in? What sounds am I hearing? Does this seem like it's a safe environment? Does it seem like it's a nurturing environment? And if it's an unsafe environment, well, then I better start prepping my body now to be a survivor. If it's a nurturing and safe environment, well, then I can allow myself to relax into that and just focus on growing and playing and being curious. So we start adapting even in utero. And these adaptations are ones that are across all levels of our body, including down to the tissue level and the cellular level. On a tissue level, we see children as early as infants starting to develop tension patterns, or we call them bracing patterns in their muscles as they're trying to keep things manageable with very uncomfortable, overwhelming sensations that they're having in their body of having to cry it out or going hungry or feeling unsafe. And they're already adapting on a tissue level with these bracing patterns and tension patterns in their muscles. But not only that, it's happening on a cellular level. And when We continue to have experiences that overwhelm us, meaning it overwhelms our ability to process it at that time, to understand it, to respond to it, to process it. Our body shuts down and it shuts down on a cellular level, going into a state of energy conservation because I'm not going to use up my energy. I'm actually needing to save up my energy in order to survive. But those start to change things like our mitochondria, which are the factory houses in our cells that make energy. It starts to affect our thyroid, our cortisol levels, which then affects all of the other hormones in our body. It starts to affect our inflammation. And we can years later start to see the the consequence of this in autoimmunity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, high blood pressure 
GI issues, whether that's irritable bowel syndrome or, or constipation or, or acid reflux, these are all, these are all symptoms and conditions that are a result of the body going into these experiences that it felt overwhelmed and needing to shut down at that time. And the more of those experiences we have, the more it shows up in our biology. And so the more that a person will have the manifestation, the expression of trauma in our physical health. Now, what happens then, Jalone, is that because this is an adaptation of our body to try to survive, but now we have all this inflammation in our body, we can also have inflammation in our brain, and we have all of these changes that, that are going on on a cellular level, those are what now will keep us stuck in a trauma response so that we can try to go to therapy and we're not going to be able to change all the effects that trauma has had on our body because our biology is now in this trauma physiology. It's a trauma biology. It's a biology of trauma. And until we know how to address that biology, we won't be able to shift it. But the most powerful thing that a person can do is if they're serious about their healing journey and really becoming their best selves and in their best health, they're going to want to address these aspects in which biology has been affected to create a biology of safety, not just emotional safety, not just psychological safety, but down on the cellular level, create a biology of safety. But that doesn't just happen by chance because by the time that a person has these changes in their biology, those are adaptations of the body and, and they don't go away. They need support. And so we actually need to address inflammation. How is it showing up? Where is it showing up? What's the reason for it showing up? How much uh, oxidative stress or you know, what's the status of our mitochondria? What about our detoxification system? Trauma will shut down our detoxification system so that over our lifetime, we are actually accumulating toxins and we are living in a toxic world. We can't get away from plastics and from chemicals and from pesticides. We, we can't. And if our detoxification system is shut down because we've been in trauma physiology, our body just holds on to those things for dear life. And this is where we also start to see the body holding on to water or, and, and thus inflammation and, and people gaining weight because it, the body is just starting to hold on to everything because it's not able to be in that healthy space of letting go and clearing things out and clearing things out that are unhealthy for me. So what happens over time is, is this biology of trauma, it happens underneath the surface and it can happen for many years underneath the surface until it finally builds enough that it actually becomes a symptom for someone. And then it becomes a condition and then it becomes a diagnosis perhaps. And so the earlier that we can start to detect these things and know that, hey, if you've had these types of experiences, if you're noticing this pattern in your nervous system, when you go through the 21 day journey, you're on this path in your physical health. And we want to get you off of that path. And here's what we do in order to accomplish that. Wow. It, it almost sounds like trauma is the catalyst for disease or one of yes. the catalysts for disease. Yes. And as you say that, I'm going to, I'm going to just go kind of one step further where the, the trauma and usually Jalone trauma, how I'm defining trauma usually starts so early in our life that it's a pre-existing condition. And then when we have that pre-existing condition, which how it changes our reactions and our nervous system, that's our pre-existing condition to be reactive. And when we have that pre-existing condition, then something else happens. And maybe it's an exposure to something. Maybe it's a heavy metal, or maybe it's a, a virus. Maybe it's a, some, some other exposure, but that pre-existing condition plus the additional exposure, then that's usually what is enough to create that diagnosis. And as I've talked with obviously thousands of patients now over my medical career, whether we're working with a cancer diagnosis 
or whether we're working with an autoimmune diagnosis or a chronic fatigue, chronic pain, fibromyalgia. These are all conditions that are strongly associated with that trauma response. And there was always a pre-existing anxiety, a pre-existing insecurity in life with themselves, and then something else happened. And for some people that's been a person very close to them passed away, or maybe it was a bad car accident, or maybe it was some other exposure, a chemical exposure, or maybe it was a big traumatic event, right? They, they saw something that just was what on top of their pre-existing uh, condition was enough to move their body all the way into that, that symptom, that condition, that disease. But what it becomes is chronic, right? And so I think that that would be the hallmark of a biology of trauma is that it becomes chronic. It's not just the flu where you, you get it and then you, you get over it. This becomes a chronic health issue that someone struggles with and is never able to finally find uh, full resolution just with the medical approach that they're doing. Okay. So I want to ask you this. Would it be... This is probably describing a lot of firefighters that you know. <laughs> a ton. <laughs> Would it be... How can I pose this question? Um, if someone has had a very, very traumatic experience or has been exposed to a lot of trauma in their life and now their physical health is suffering as a result, but they may not be able to put the pieces together between trauma and their ailments, would they really be able to achieve true healing physically without ever addressing their trauma? No, because it's, it's all, it's all the same thing, Jalone, right? Like, I feel like that's the lens of this biology of trauma is that this is the body and you can't separate the body from, oh, well, that was emotional and that's physical. Like it's just one system. It's one nervous system. And the trauma continues to create that pre-existing condition that I talked about. And as long as we have that pre-existing condition, which is this trauma stored in the body, it's, it's always going to be there and it will continue to drive health symptoms throughout our lifetime. And the older that we get, the, the more that it will manifest in our physical health. So no, I have never seen anyone. And I don't think that it is consistent with science to be able to say that someone could achieve full healing only with a medical approach without addressing the stored trauma in our body. And it is my understanding and view that everyone has experienced some degree of trauma. And so we all have trauma work to do. And I've, I've read that if a mother is having a very stressful um, pregnancy and has had some trauma during her, her pregnancy, that that trauma can be passed to the infant or to the child without their even, I mean, and, and just thinking about that to me, it you, you don't even get a start or, or a good start if, if, you're, if your mom had a rough pregnancy and was dealing with a lot of things, you, you come out with trauma in your biology, you know? Yes, this is true. And for me, what has been helpful is to see it through the lens of surviving. And so for me, what was helpful to me, and I'll share it with you in case it is helpful to you and your listeners, rather than seeing it as, man, like I didn't even have a chance. Like I, I came out with trauma. <laughs> And there's many people who do, many people who do. And, and you just look across the world and see how many infants even have trouble during their birth. Maybe they're born with the cord around their neck or maybe, right? Like these are all trauma events for an infant. And so there's so many people, so many people, more than what they realize because 
that, that, that wouldn't necessarily be classified as a, oh, wow, yeah, you, you've had trauma. You were born with the cord around your neck. But these are all the traumatic experiences that get stored in our body. But when we look at it through the lens of survival, by my body adapting to the stress, to the trauma, it helped me survive at that time, Jalone. At that time, it was exactly what my body needed to do to help it survive at that time. And so I'm very grateful for my trauma response. I'm very grateful that my body adapted in that way because at that time, it wouldn't have survived if my body had not adapted to the stress and trauma that it was already encountering. And now as an adult, I get to create the life that I want to have. And the life that I want to have no longer needs to have that trauma response driving my life, my decisions, my health. And so I get to do the work now to help my body adapt. It's the same adaptations. It adapts to trauma and it adapts out of trauma. And this is where we bring in the words around neuroplasticity. We can actually use neuroplasticity for our benefit because we can create the experiences that we need now for our body to come out of that chronic trauma response and be able to express the safety and the connection that we do want to have. So it's just adaptations and the adaptations are for a reason. And those reasons are always, always, always for our best survival. We talked a little bit about, and you mentioned it a few times, the nervous system. And I think that when, when I think of the nervous system, I may not really truly have a, a good idea or concept of what it is without like researching it. So I wanted to ask you, like, what is the nervous system and what is it comprised of? How does it work? Um, all those things. There are different, uh, I want to say branches and divisions of our nervous system. And most people are familiar with the central nervous system, which refers to our brain, right? So that's our central nervous system. And it includes our brain, our brain stem, and our spinal cord. But coming out of that central nervous system are all these other nerves that actually go to the body and carry out messages and send signals and gather information to feed it back to the central nervous system. And this is where we get to talk about the peripheral nervous system. So the central and the peripheral. So the peripheral just means on the outside. And it is referring to the nerves that are outside of that central nervous system. And the peripheral nervous system is, uh, there are different functions of it. Some of those nerves are what actually make our muscles move, right? So we have what are called like the, the somatic peripheral nerves that carry those messages from our brain to move our body, move our muscles in a certain way. We also have the nerves that are bringing back sensory information so that when someone touches my skin or when someone holds my hand, I, I feel that and I feel that because those nerves are carrying information back up from my skin, from my arm, from my hand to my brain so that it can process someone is holding my hand right now. And we have these other nerves that are part of the, this peripheral nervous system that are called the autonomic nervous system. And these are the nerves that specifically control the organs in our body, the tissues in our body, in a way that's automatic so that we don't have to be using our brain, our central nervous system, to consciously control how our kidneys are filtering our blood, how our liver is making bile and helping to detox, how our heart is beating, our lungs are breathing. So everything is on automatic with this branch of the peripheral nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. And similarly, there are messages that go out to these tissues, but 80% of the messages in these nerves are carrying information from the body back to the brain. And that's significant because the trauma response is 
stored, is communicated in this autonomic branch of our nervous system. It contains the vagus nerve, which is one of the cranial nerves that comes out of our brainstem. And it's controlling all of these automatic functions of our body so that when it is the best decision for our body to shut down, it communicates all of that through the vagus nerve. Now, the sympathetic nerves is what controls the fight or flight response, that stress response. And that's a chain of nerves that runs down our spine. And so when we go into stress response, right, like for you guys, I'm sure it's, there's, you know, a, a, an announcement that there's a fire and you, you guys gotta, gotta get going. So there's that activation, there's that energy, there's that stress response, and that's all being communicated by that sympathetic nerve chain down both sides of your spines. And that is what's sending out messages. But the moment in which things become overwhelming and someone experiences something that feels too big for them, too much for them, then it switches. And now the communication is not going to be the stress down that sympathetic chain, but it's going to switch to go down the vagus nerve in the autonomic nervous system and tell everything to just shut down. And that's where people will start to feel very heavy. They'll feel exhausted. They just want to sit on the couch. They want to do things mindlessly, whether that's watch TV mindlessly or scroll through social media mindlessly. They are in that state where everything feels harder. Everything feels like it takes a lot of energy and they, they don't feel like they've got a lot of energy. That is when a person will know that their physiology is communicating the trauma response through their nervous system. Is that helpful? Very, very much so because I know it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot, but it's super informative and it explains what's happening, how it's happening. And it's not just, oh, you know, my, my nerves are sick. You know, it, it, it puts a picture with, with what we are actually experiencing so that we can understand. So thank you for that explanation. And you did an amazing job. Yeah. And Jalon, I think like, that's what I want to bring people. Right. And that's what I do. That's why I designed the 21 day journey in part is to be able to help people understand their body, understand their reaction so that it's not just something that happens and they don't really know what's happening. They know exactly what's happening and they know exactly what their body needs when it is in that stress response. I need to give my body a sense of support right now. And when it has gone to that trauma response, what does it need right now? It needs a sense of safety. It just needs a sense of safety. Don't try to process. Don't try to talk. Don't try to do all this other stuff. You're in the trauma response right now. The only thing it needs is safety time. And with, and, and with that time will come energy that we can do a lot with supplements to help that as well. But just the understanding, right? Like that's what changed everything for me is being able to understand it so that it, it wasn't confusing anymore. And I didn't feel like I was just at the mercy of my body and it doing whatever it was doing, but it put me into this place where I have something to do. I, I know what to do. I know what's happening and I know what to do. Wow. Well, that's great. That's so great. Um, now, something that's happening this month on the 18th is the third annual Biology of Trauma Summit. Um, can you give some details about the summit and, and how it came to be? Yeah, so registration is opening on the 18th for my annual uh, Biology of Trauma Summit. So this is the third annual summit. And this year, the topic is the trauma disease connection. So more details on what we've started to talk today about this idea of how trauma becomes our biology and what are those symptoms, conditions, diseases that are associated with trauma. So that as we are understanding, maybe looking at our own health or maybe the health of a family member, or if you're a professional, right? Like the, the health of someone that you work with, but being able to see, oh my goodness, like they have, they have these symptoms, they have these conditions that are evidence. It's the body communicating, hey, I have stored trauma, help me. And we're able to, to hear those messages now, see that that is an expression of trauma in the body through this trauma disease connection. So I've interviewed, oh my goodness, like nearly 50 
experts across the field of trauma and medicine, neuroscience, attachment, brought them all together for this online summit. And it's happening the week of August 1 through 7. So every day there will be different interviews that get released and they can watch those, get educated, get informed on the trauma disease connection and start to piece together their clear path forward. Wow. I um, for sure want to make sure that I'm a part of that so that I can see it because it sounds like, I mean, if you have 50 experts, that's, that's got to be something that would just provide so much information and so, so much knowledge and, you know, 50 people that are experts in the field. I'm sure you, you can't watch that and not come away with something. Yeah. I'm excited to hear what you think and what you get out of it, Jalon. I'll let you know for sure. Um, so the last question I wanted to ask you, if you could use your platform, <laughs> you could use your platform to encourage someone who may be struggling with um, understanding what's happening to them if they get triggered or talking to somebody about their big feelings and emotions, um, what would you say to them? Don't settle. Like, don't, don't settle here. Life can be so much better. Life can be so much richer. Life can be full of so much more joy and expansion and you actually becoming your authentic self without your emotions or beliefs about yourself or even your physical health holding you back. Like, just don't settle here. Don't stop here. There is so much more that is possible. That was great advice. Well, Dr. Amy, I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to do this with you. I think that you are just outstanding in what you do and what you've had to go through to get to where you are now means that you've been through it. So it's not like you're just reading a book and telling someone, you know, this is, this is what I read from what I've studied, but you, you've actually been there, done that. So I think that puts you in a position to really be able to give people some great tools to work with and some, some great advice as well. Well, right back at you, Jalone. Not everyone is willing to talk about the hard things of the human experience. <laughs> and I applaud you for what, for what you do and how you do it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. If someone wanted to find you online or on social media, where can they find you? My website is traumahealingaccelerated.com, but they can also just Google search Dr. Amy and in biology of trauma. They can find me on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all under the name Dr. Amy and look forward to sharing resources with them. Sounds good. Well, again, Dr. Amy, thank you so much for this. This has been so wonderful. Um, thank you for your time, for what you do, for how you do it and for who you are. <laughs>